This is our fourth lesson in our study of six anchor chapters for the saint. Next week, we'll be looking at the book of John, chapter 17, the real Lord's Prayer. And then in the following week, our last lesson, 1 Corinthians, chapter 15. I'm sure most of you are familiar with this uh, passage. You've heard parts of it or all of it at one time or another. There are three parables in this chapter. The lost sheep, the lost coin, and then as what is commonly referred to as the parable of the prodigal son. Verses 1 through 10 tell us of the setting that we're looking at, which is Jesus is visiting with sinners and eating with them, and he's being accused by the Pharisees being with these sinners and eating with them, people that they would normally shun. Then it says in verse 3, And he spake this parable unto them. And then we find the three parables. All three are to the Pharisees. And the, the key to each one of these is that there is a seeker. And the seeker that Jesus is explaining to them by analogy is God the Father. The first parable, what man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? It is a very common thing. It is something that all would have done. It is not unusual that an individual who has lost a sheep would seek out to find out where the sheep went. Verse 5, and when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulder and rejoices. Verse 6, when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying, rejoice with me. I have found my sheep, which was lost. One out of 100, this shepherd went to look for him. He loved all his sheep. Verse 7, Jesus said, And I say to you, likewise, joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than ninety-nine just persons which need no repentance. So he is letting them know that one individual, sheep, is more valuable than 99 good ones, the one that is lost and found. And likewise, in heaven, it rejoices at one who is lost that is found. Now he's talked about a man as a shepherd. Now he's going to talk about a lady with a coin. And what woman, having ten pieces of silver... If she lose one piece, does not light a candle, sweep the house, and seek diligently till she finds it. First we had a hundred sheep, one lost. Now we have ten coins, one lost. And when she hath found it, she too calls her friends, her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the piece which I had lost. And then he says, likewise, just like what happened with the shepherd, happened with the lady with the coin. Likewise, in heaven, there is joy in the presence of the angels over one sinner that repents. In the presence of the angels of heaven, there is rejoicing because one sinning human being has claimed Christ as Savior. Some of you may have been like myself. We, I would love watching the Billy Graham Crusades on TV. In my younger days, I remember sitting around watching on Channel 5 KTLA, which happened to be owned by Gene Autry, God bless his heart, and he funded the entire thing himself. He put Billy Graham on his channel. Everything he did, he broadcasted. 
And when you'd see the crowd come out of the stadium and come down to the front to get saved, it was moving. Cliff Barrows told the story that when they were in England and they were singing Just As I Am Without One Plea, the writers of the newspaper said, oh, it's just too emotional. All those people are not coming for Jesus. They're coming because of the emotion. So Dr. Graham says, don't sing the song. We're going to watch what happens. I'm going to make the invitation. We're going to say, come. So he did that. And sure enough, here comes all the footsteps and all the squeaking of the bleachers. People getting up, going down to the front. He did that for a month. And guess what the journalist said then? It's too much emotion. Bring back the singing. (laughs) In verse 11, we turn to the parable of the prodigal son, as we call it. But remember that all three of these refer to our Heavenly Father. He says, a certain man had two sons. The clue to who is the object lesson here is in the first words that Jesus gives us a certain man. The story is about the father who has two sons. We have always looked at this traditionally as being a prodigal son. I want to show you that there's two. And the younger of them said to his father, give me the portion of goods that falleth to me. And he divided unto them his living. The younger was saying, dear daddy, I'm tired of you still being alive. I want my inheritance. Give it to me now. What kind of a cheeky kid would do something like that? Michael Ramsden, when he was teaching on this, he says, you know, in the, in the Middle East where he grew up when his father was consulting to some of the nations there. And he said the typical thing would have been for the father to reach around and grab a club and start beating on the kid for saying such a thing. And what was also typical, which is not said here, is that the eldest son was supposed to be a peacekeeper in the family. Whenever the father would get mad at one of the children, he would step in and say, okay, father, that's enough. So he would say, okay, dad, you know, this impudent son here has opened up his mouth one too many times and you've given him a a good beating, but he doesn't deserve to die over that. So spare him and I'll watch over this nincompoop and straighten him out. And the father would stop beating the son. But we don't see that here. What we see is the father divides his living and circle that word, divided it unto them. The eldest son typically gets twice as much as the other kids. So the youngest son is getting one third. The eldest son is getting two thirds and he takes it. There's no word about that unless you stop to think about what's being said. And out after many days, the youngest son gathered all together. He took all of the stuff that he got, went to the hawk shop and got cash for it. And he took a journey unto a far country. He leaves the entire area. And there he wasted his substance with riotous living. The word that is used here for wasted is the same word that is used when a farmer broadcasts his seed. You remember the story of the seed and the sower. And some of it fell on to a pathway. Some of it fell onto rocky soil. Some of it fell onto thorny soil. And some of it fell onto good soil. Well, it tells you that the farmer wasn't really paying attention where it was going. He was just tossing it. Um, Occasionally, I've heard some friends talk about their uh, landscape gardeners who would come. And they said, all they think they have to do is mow, blow, and go. Mow that lawn, blow it off, and then boogie on off to the next house. And uh, (laughs) 
This guy that's doing the seed is more or less doing a thing. He's grabbing a handful, chucking it, and grabbing another handful and chucking it. And the quicker he can get done, the quicker he can go get his in and out burger and call it a day. And that's what he means by wasted. He didn't pay any attention whatsoever to where it was going. He just let it go. And it says on riotous living in the King James, the, some other translations use some different terms. It's interesting that that particular word that Jesus chose here for riotous living, asotos, A-S-O-T-O-S, is only used once in the entire New Testament, and it's Jesus using it. This particular word refers to wasteful extravagance without consideration, without thinking about the consequences. The younger son squanders all he has on temporary worldly pleasures, on expensive food, on clothes, on shelter, on entertainment, wanton, wasteful lavishness. Some would say he lived like there was no tomorrow. He lived like there was no tomorrow. And verse 14 tells us tomorrow came. Verse 14, and when he had spent all, and it seemed like God just waited till he did that and then sent the consequences. There arose a mighty famine in the land, and he began to be in want. A famine came upon the area where he was and hid it like a train wreck. And having squandered all of his resources, he was now des- in desperate need. He was hurting. He was alone. And he was starving. Verse 15. And when he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, he was fortunate enough to find a job. Maybe. Continue reading. And he sent him into the fields to feed the swine. That was an immediate red flag. This is a Jewish boy being sent out to the fields to feed the pigs. The man was a swine herder. Adam Clark, in his commentary, said swine herders were held in great contempt by the Jews. Herodotus, the Greek historian, said in Egypt, swine herders were not allowed to enter into temples of worship, nor were they allowed to mingle in society. And if anyone were to marry a swine herder, they were immediately shunned. Jesus is using this reference intentionally in order to get the attention of the Pharisees and use this as an object lesson that this Jewish boy had sunk to the deepest depths of complete loss of human dignity and self-esteem. He had literally become loathsome in his own sight. The question now arises for the Pharisees to answer. Has this boy gotten so bad that he's irredeemable? For a typical Jew in that day, he would be a living, walking, dead man. Depraved, perverted, corrupted, and beyond redemption. So this man sends this young boy out to feed the pigs. And what it does not say is that he didn't. He did not send a sack lunch with the boy as he fed the pigs. Verse 16. And speaking of the young boy, he would fain have filled his belly with the husks that the swine did eat. And no man gave unto him. The word husks here actually refers to bean pods that come from carob trees. They're about 10 inches long. And they would just strip the trees of these carob seeds and the husks and throw them into the pen with the swine for them to be fed. He would have eaten that himself if he had been allowed to. But he could not because the punishment for eating the food that was meant for the animals was to be beaten. He wasn't even allowed to eat that. He would have It says, Fain had filled his stomach on pig food. Mandela worked at a bank a number of years ago. One of the ladies that was there was a recent 
transplant from England. And she hadn't been in the United States very long. And the bank had a potluck. And one of the real nice, sweet ladies thought that she would bring a real treat to everybody at the potluck. And she brought a great big kettle of corn on the cob. And that lady from England just liked the jumped out of her skin. She almost ran away from that pot. And Della said, what's the matter? And she says, that's pig food. We don't eat pig food. The corn's still on the cob. No, 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 you don't eat that. You cut the corn off and then you eat it. <laughs> this was gross for her. And may I say, it was gross for that boy to eat the carob beans too. And he would have had he been given an opportunity. Verse 17 says, And when he came to himself, this is a rather uh, common term that is used for anybody that is deranged who recovers from their madness. Literally, it means when he came out of his insanity. Albert Barnes said, sin is insanity. In the book of Romans, chapter one, verse 20, it says the first symptom of insanity is when a person begins to deny the existence of God, of God and refuses to give him thanks. Now, this young boy, it says here in verse 17, he said, how many hired servants of my father's have bread enough and to spare and I perish with hunger? He kind of took a look around and he said to himself, self, my father's servants have got more food than they need. Enough and to spare. It's interesting when you stop to categorize what's being said here. From the beginning, when he had all his money, he was eating, may I say, no pun intended, high off the hog. So, you know, I mean, <laughs> he was eating caviar and lobster and chocolate mousse and then and out burgers till there was just no more to have, you know. The subject was food. Lots of food. He had all the food he could eat and more. And then the famine hit and he began to starve. So the question is, what's the subject? Food. Then in verse 15, he goes to work for a pig farmer and he is doing what? Food. He's feeding the pigs. But guess what? He doesn't get any. Food. The subject is food. Then in verse 16, it says that no one would give him anything. Food. Verse 17, when he comes out of his insanity, the first thing he thinks of, hey, back in my father's house, food, lots of food, enough food for the servants to eat. And despair. He says to himself, I, verse 18, I will arise and go to my father and will say unto my father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee, verse 19, and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. That's thinking about, okay, I know where I can get some food. And off he goes. Now he planned his work. He worked his plan. And he arose and came to his father. But when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him. The father was looking for the son. Scanning the horizon in hopes that he might get a glimmer of that young boy coming home. And it's, it says the father had compassion, great pity. His heart was touched and he ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It says the father ran, but it doesn't say the boy ran. In that day, and as you may look in the Middle East, a lot of men wear robes. And in order for a guy to run, 
He's got to reach down, grab the back of that robe and jerk it all the way up and stick the back into the front of his belt and boogie. And men in that area don't wear Levi's and Reeboks. They wear these robes, right? So one of the things that Michael Ramson pointed out is when a man does this, he does something that in their culture is humiliating. He exposes his legs. But this father didn't care about what other people thought about him. He was in love with his son. And if it meant that he would be humiliated in order to go get that son, he was willing to do it. He would cast away all status, all class, all authority, all position and power. He wanted that son. And he ran to him and kissed him, which is the common welcome. But you know what he doesn't do? He doesn't talk. He didn't say anything. He stands there and he looks at his son and he waits. James Dobson said, if you want your kids to listen to you, you need to listen to them first. So the father waits for the son to speak. Verse 21. And the son said, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in thy sight and am no more worthy to be called thy son. Can I stop right there for a minute? When I was reading this to you up here in verses 18 and 19, verse 19 says, and I am no worthy, more worthy to be called your son. Verse 21, I am no more worthy to be called your son. And he doesn't get a chance to say, make me a hired servant. What happened? Jack Hayford said, there should be a verse 21 and a half right here. <laughs> And verse 21 and a half would be the rest of his his uh, apology to his father and make me a hired servant. But he wasn't able to say it because at that moment, when he said, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son, the father grabs him and pulls his head close to him and smothers him and praises God. His son is home and says, my son who was dead is alive. Twenty one and a half is the rest of that boy's uh, apology to his father. Father, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. <laughs> As the father is embracing his son and rejoicing that he is home. Verse 22, the father said, bring the best robe, put a ring on his finger and shoes on his feet. Suddenly the son now. He is brought back. He is restored into his earlier position. He's given the family clothing to wear. He is now being separated and distinguished from the servants in the family. He's a member of the family. He's not a servant to the family. He's given a ring of authority, the same authority that the father has, the son now has. If the father were to say something or the son were to say something, it's the same. So when the son speaks, he speaks for the father. And that is the message that Christ has given you and me. I have given you my name that when you pray in my name, I will do it. He has given us the authority of the family of God so much so that Paul says in Ephesians, we share the throne with Christ. And then he put shoes on his feet. Typically, servants don't wear shoes. But now he is at the position of status. He is put into the level of superiority. He is fully restored and redeemed back to his privileged position as a son of the father. The father did not pursue the son. The son knew that he was lost and how he got in that condition. The sheep did not know how he got lost. He knew he was lost, but he didn't know his way home. The coin was lost, but he didn't know he was lost and he didn't care that he was lost. But the one who loved the coin knew he was lost and pursued him. The book of Ephesians chapter two says that we Gentiles, not knowing God, Or even caring about God. We're loved by God. And he pursued us. He sent his son to die for us. 
that we might know him. For the son, he was the reason why he was lost. Where he was, he was lost, and he knew his way home. He had to make the choice to get up and come home. The father did not pursue him, and one person said, It does no good to pursue a wayward child before they are ready to change. But what we must always do is leave a light on, leave a door open. That they may know that they can come back. That the opportunity to return is always there. But they have to want to first. John Agee says, To give God's forgiveness to someone who is not repentant is to make God's grace an accessory to sin. Jesus told many people, You are forgiven, go and sin no more. Verse 22, the father said, bring these, the robe, bring the ring and put shoes on his feet. Verse 23, kill the fatted calf. This is the celebration calf. The one that is for all the neighbors and all the community come and celebrate at this house and make merry. Verse 25, now the elder brother was in the field, and as he came, he drew nigh to the house, and he heard the music and the dancing. And he said, What is going on? And one of the servants, verse 27, Thy brother is come, and thy father hath killed the fatted calf, and because he hath received him, safe and sound. And the response by the elder brother was rage. He was angry. And he would not go in. He alienated himself from the desire of the father to celebrate. He alienated himself from the rejoicing that the brother had come home. Therefore, the father came out to him. The father had to seek him and talk to him and explain to him what was going on. And he entreated him begged him. Verse 29. Lo, these many years do I serve thee, the boy said to the father. Neither transgress I at any time, and yet you have not even killed a kid for me to make merry. Verse 30. The son continues, the elder son, thy son, he doesn't call him brother, thy son, which hath devoured thy living with harlots. Thou hast killed for him the fatted calf. How did he know that the son had spent all of his money on harlots? Jesus said he wasted it on riotous living. He didn't say anything about harlots. It was a word that Jesus was familiar with. He used it in Matthew 26. He said to the Pharisees, harlots will get into heaven before you. That that got their attention. It wasn't harlots. It was extravagance. It was lavishness, which tells us that extravagance and lavishness are not immoral and they're not sin. They are what they are. Stuff. And the worst thing you can do is let stuff get a hold of your heart. The father says, son, thou art ever with me and catch this. All that I have is thine. There was nothing left when he divided up all that he had and gave it to his boys. The younger one spent it all. The elder one was now in control of it all. Nothing that was the father's was the father's anymore. It belonged to the elder son. And then he says, is it not right that we should make merry and be glad for this? Thy brother who was dead is now alive again and was lost And he is found. The end. Let's go home. Yeah, there's nothing left, is there? What's going on here? Interesting. The elder son was filled with ingratitude to the father for the blessings and the riches that he had received. 
He was filled with hatred for the grace and the forgiveness that the father had expressed to the younger son. He refused to forgive the younger son who sinned, even though the younger son had not sinned against him. The younger son had sinned against the father, not against the brother. The spitefulness, the pettiness, and the envious of men contrasted with the meekness, the love, and the forgiveness, and the grace of God. Those are the two contrasts that come out of this lesson. The Pharisees had no problem with seeing a man bring back a sheep. They had no problem with seeing a woman bring back